Something that always interests me in stories is the difference between a character's actual presence and their narrative presence. A character's actual presence is how often they are actually on screen, whereas their narrative presence is how much that character affects the narrative, how much their choices and actions are driving the story, how often other characters are talking or thinking about them, how often they precipitate choices made by other characters. In God of War 4, Kratos is a character with a lot of actual presence, because he's on screen for the entire game, and he's a character with a ton of narrative presence too, because everything he's doing is driving the story forward. In God of War 4, Thor was a character with no actual presence in the story. Outside of a single post-game easter egg, Thor never actually appears in the game, but by contrast he has a ton of narrative presence. Throughout the game we hear story after story about Thor, about his incredible feats in battle, his drunkenness, his destructiveness, and his violence. The world of Midgard as Kratos and Atreus experience it in the present was in many ways molded by Thor's actions along with his father Odin. Thor and Odin are the ones who killed all the giants, who caused Jotunheim to seal itself off from the other realms, who sent Fey into hiding. Despite having no actual presence in the story, Thor's narrative presence is enormous. His past actions absolutely affect everything that occurs in the story, and players will develop a really clear image of Thor in their heads. We know that Thor is a warrior, perhaps the strongest warrior of all time, that he is incredibly violent and destructive, that he kills without mercy or compassion. We know that he severely beat his own son Modi and blamed him for the death of his elder son Magni. So he's not just violent with his enemies, but with his own family too. We know he is a drunk. All stories about Thor in Norse mythology mention his drinking. He drinks truly godly amounts of alcohol. The amount he drinks in a single sitting would outright kill most people. Before Thor ever appears in God of War Ragnarok, players should feel like they already know exactly who Thor is, which is what makes his portrayal in Ragnarok so surprising. Because, for the most part, the Thor of Ragnarok is not that violent, destructive, merciless, compassionless, drunken warrior we've heard so much about. Instead, the Thor of Ragnarok is kind of submissive and miserable, stuck beneath the thumb of his emotionally abusive father, mourning the deaths of his sons, in domestic squabbles with his wife Sif, in struggling to overcome alcoholism. We get thunderous glimpses of the great warrior side of Thor, but they are short and fleeting. How do we explain this discrepancy? How do we understand this difference between what we've heard about him and what we see when we finally meet him? Were all those stories wrong? Were they lies or misconceptions? Was Thor always this miserable, broken man? I don't think so. I think all those stories we heard about Thor were absolutely truthful. There's enough evidence throughout the games to back them up. Thor used to be a violent and merciless destroyer, who didn't care who he killed, a man who was happy to drink enough alcohol to drown a blue whale. That is who he used to be, but the Thor we meet in Ragnarok is a character in transition, a character in the midst of transformation. Something has happened to him off screen. During the gap between the two games, he started changing. So what was it? What happened to Thor? I think the answer to that question should be really obvious. Both of his sons are dead. Magni and Modi were killed by Kratos and Atreus in the last game. Along with everything else, we also knew that Thor was a father. A terrible father. Just look at how brutally he beat Modi for nothing. But still a father, still someone who cared about his children. Parenthood, child-parent relationships, hard questions surrounding the right way to raise a child are so central to these two Norse God of War games. And Thor's story is all about those themes too. We actually saw Thor's initial reaction to losing his first son back in God of War 4. We saw it in how he beat Modi, who he blamed for his eldest son's death. Thor's first reaction to learning of his son's death was the same reaction he had to everything in his life. Violence. Extreme violence. And that violent reaction leads to the loss of his second son, too. It's only because Modi was weakened by his father's beating that Atreus was able to kill him. The Thor in God of War Ragnarok is a Thor who has had to face the fact that his violence, all his choices, his whole life leading up to that point. It all led to the loss of both his sons. He's also probably had to face the fact that he was a bad father, that he raised two really crappy sons. Magni and Modi were selfish, greedy, didn't care about anyone but themselves, and they were weak, both physically and 
psychologically. Not only are Thor's sons dead, but his sons sucked. And it's at least partly, if not entirely, his own fault. What does a parent do in this situation? What can they do? Interestingly, there is another example of a character who is also in this exact situation in the game. Freya. Her son Baldur is dead. And even when he was alive, he sucked. And both of those facts were at least partly her fault. So what does Freya do? Well, instead of confronting any of that, she gives herself entirely over to a quest for vengeance. As long as all her thoughts are consumed by vengeance, she doesn't have to think about the mistakes she made. It's very surprising to me that Thor didn't give himself over to the same kind of quest for vengeance. But Freya's situation is different in some ways. Freya is alone. She is without any family. She is exiled from her home. Thor is not alone. Thor still has a tyrannical and overbearing father making all his decisions for him. He still has a wife who cares about him. And more than anything, he still has a daughter, Thrud. He still has one child left. He still has a chance to correct his past mistakes, to be a better father, to raise a better child. And that's why I think he makes a different choice than Freya does. One of the most interesting aspects of Thor's character is that, at the start of Ragnarok, he's a character who has already hit rock bottom off screen, but he is also already in the process of picking himself back up, already trying to be better. We can see that in his sobriety. In his first scenes, we see Thor being tempted by but still refusing to drink, because off screen he's made a choice to be better, and he's sticking to that choice. He is really trying to be better and succeeding. Let's watch Thor's first couple scenes in the game, and as you do, I want you to remember the journey Thor has been on to reach this point. He is a father who lost his sons, who hit rock bottom, who had to face his mistakes, who has decided to be better, and who is now facing the man who killed his sons for the first time. All of that is going through Thor's head during this first scene. I come in. I have me. You would not find me good company. No. I'm sure we'll find lots to talk about. could have told me before I poured. Why are you here? Just uh, being polite. You seem like a 
calm and reasonable person. Are you a calm and reasonable person? If the moment calls for calm, I'd say the moment calls for calm. <laughs> yeah. For half a second, Thor is exactly who you expect him to be. The storm, the thunder, the lightning, the billowing cloak, the reveal of Mjolnir, and the expectation of a fight. Then the half second passes and we see a very different Thor. A quiet Thor. Something that interests me here is how little Thor speaks. And ultimately, that's because he doesn't have much to say. I don't think Thor wants to have a conversation with Kratos. He doesn't have anything he really wants to say to Kratos. He doesn't want to hear anything Kratos might say. He doesn't want to hear any explanations or excuses for why his sons were killed. Thor is only here for one reason, and that's to pave the way for Odin. He's just here to make sure Kratos is, in what I'd guess are probably Odin's words, a calm and reasonable person. Odin told Thor beforehand, make sure Kratos is acting like a calm and reasonable person, and if he is, then I'll come too. Thor is on a very tight leash in this scene, and as it turns out, he has been for his entire life. Thor is Odin's bruiser, his bulldog his muscle. Thor kills things Odin wants killed, and otherwise Thor doesn't need to say or think anything for himself. Except that's changing. Like I've said before, Thor is changing. You can see it in the way he sniffs the mead, clearly appreciates the smell, considers partaking, and chooses to put the cup back down. Next, let's watch just a tiny bit of Odin's part here in this first scene, to see Thor's interactions with his father. Now, what you did to his boys, Self-defense. Dying is what we Aesir live for. And let's be honest, they were kind of useless. But Balder, he had value. He was my best tracker, my closer. Yeah, his mind was gone, sure. But he had his uses and now he's gone because of you. You follow me? You have a debt. You're no fun anymore. What do you want? Odin's behavior towards Thor is despicable in this scene. Throughout the game, Odin treats Thor worse than he treats anyone. Because Thor is so physically strong, because Odin could never beat him in a fight, Odin tries to constantly beat Thor emotionally into submission instead. Odin has to be the one in charge, and he's willing to humiliate and shame and bully his son to do it. The way he calls Thor's dead sons useless right to his face is disgusting. Kratos hated those sons too. Kratos killed those sons, and even he doesn't say anything this gross about them, not to Thor's face. The way Odin tries to manipulate Thor into drinking, into falling off the wagon, into giving up his sobriety, that's disgusting too. If someone is trying to overcome an addiction to alcohol, and you start waving a drink in their face and accusing them of being no fun anymore when they're not drinking, that is truly despicable behavior. Especially considering this is Thor's father. This is someone who should want what's best for Thor, should want him to be healthy and sober. But Odin wants Thor drunk because he's easier to control when he's drunk. Odin doesn't care about Thor, he just cares about how he can best use him. Let's watch two scenes from much later in the game that further this point. Look at this, we make a good team, don't we? Don't we? Make a good damn team? Just like you and Balder. You both behave out there? Thor was really great. I learned a lot from him. You learned something from him? Really now? <laughs> okay. What did you teach the kid? Nothing. What could I possibly teach him? Exactly. What are you going on about? I just don't get it. The mask. Bringing the giant that killed my sons here. Why? <laughs> I can explain it to you, but I can't understand it for you. Stop letting your wife think for you. She's clouding whatever's left of your brain. This isn't about her. No, it's about your limitations. Accept them and move on. Now go smash something, will you? Honestly, I liked you better as a drunk. 
Loki, come here. Odin relentlessly insults Thor's intelligence, belittles him, shames him, laughs at him, and tries to make him feel stupid in these scenes. It's truly disgusting behavior, and it works. Notice the way Thor says, what could I possibly teach him? I think Thor really believes that. His father has spent his whole life convincing him that he's stupid, so he really believes that he is stupid, that he has nothing to contribute, that he couldn't think for himself even if he tried. Also notice Odin I liked you better when you were drunk. Odin is not only belittling his intelligence, but still trying to push him into drinking again, which also works. Thor does fall off the wagon after this. He does go back to drinking, and I'm sure Odin is delighted by it. He wants Thor drunk and dumb so he will never become a threat to him. Let's go back to that first scene though. When Odin's manipulations fail to work on Kratos, he sicks Thor on him so Odin can have some time alone to manipulate Atreus instead. And finally, we get to see Thor off the leash. The true Thor. See what he really wants to say to Kratos. Don't take all day. About time. You're not from here. We got a tradition called our blood payments. It means I get a piece of you for what you took from my family. You'll pick it up. That was for Baldur. Now show me this god killer I've heard too much about! This battle is spectacular. The cinematics, the epic quality, it is just awesome. It's not a difficult boss fight, but in terms of cinema and drama, it is up there with some of the best in the series. Here we finally see the Thor we heard about in the previous games. The great warrior, the violent destroyer, the merciless killer. He's very powerful. He actually kills Kratos at one point during this fight. It's not that extraordinary, since Kratos has died like five times over the course of this series, but it still goes to show just how strong Thor is. One of the few opponents Kratos has faced who have the power to defeat him, and it demonstrates how much control Thor has over this fight. He can kill Kratos and restart his heart at a whim. This is Thor at his most content and most powerful in the game. Thor lives to fight. He lives for battle. He says he wants a blood payment from Kratos in exchange for the killing of his sons. You'd think that would mean blood for blood, in exchange for killing my sons, I kill you. But that's not what Thor wants, at least not yet. All throughout the fight, he keeps saying to Kratos, stop holding back, show me your true self, show me your power, show me the god killer who killed my sons. I think Thor wants one last really good battle before the prophesied end of Asgard. Some of the only interests he has in life are blood and battle. He doesn't have hobbies. He just wants to see a truly great warrior in action at his peak. The blood payment he wants is seeing that god killer side of Kratos. And when he gets it, he's satisfied, at least for now. Let's fast forward way ahead in the story to when Atreus journeys to Asgard. Odin tasks Atreus with gathering fragments of this mask, and to help out he sends Thor with him. I find this whole section of the game to be fascinating. I know there are some people who find the Atreus sections of the game to be boring, but from a story standpoint they are all super compelling. Sticking these two characters together Letting them speak to each other and bounce off each other was a really smart decision by the writers. There's so much fertile ground for conflict and understanding between the two of them. There's this moment where Atreus asks Thor, what do you think? And Thor just says, do your job. That's Thor's whole life. That's what Odin has molded him into. Don't think, just shut up and do your job. Atreus confronts Thor over the slaying of the giants, and here we get a little glimpse of the old Thor, the merciless, compassionless killer. When Thor responds by saying, I reveled in their deaths. We see it again when Thor beats the 
Surtur trials, and he boasts of the rivers of blood and mountains of corpses he left behind. Thor also keeps repeating this phrase, don't try to play me, threatening Atreus if Atreus tries to trick him. I think this reveals an anxiety Thor has. He thinks he's unintelligent, and he doesn't want to be tricked and manipulated, doesn't want his intelligence used against him, which is ironic since it's Odin, his father, who is really the one manipulating him. And Atreus even manages to get Thor to trust him, at least a little bit. The next time Odin sends Atreus and Thor to find a mask fragment, we find Thor in this tavern, dead ass drunk. He's fallen off the wagon, failed his sobriety, failed himself, and failed his family too. Let's watch a bit of it. Right where I thought you'd be. Why are you to be here? You shouldn't be here. You. You shouldn't have brought her here. What are you doing? Relaxing. Did I say no rush? I meant we should get going, right? We don't want to keep the Allfather- QUIET! He's right. You should get going. <laughs> Dad? Don't do this. It's already done. Let it be known, the God of Thunder is good for two things. Killing giants and pissing me! Any man who disagrees will greet Mjolnir with its face. This isn't you. Thor comes off as totally pathetic here because he's a drunk loser. To be fair, there's really no other kind of drunk. Drinking turns you into a loser. As someone who has definitely drunk a lot more than I should have in my life, I feel very comfortable in saying drinking turns us all into losers. This is what Thor was fighting, fighting against becoming this person. This is who he didn't want to be anymore, and it's who Odin wants him to be. In some ways, this scene serves as an indictment of Odin as a father. Odin cares so little for his son that this is who he wants his son to be, a drunk loser, miserable, pathetic. Notice when Thor says, The God of Thunder is good for two things, killing giants and pissing mead. That's what Odin wants. A Thor who only ever does those two things, kills who he wants killed, and gets pissed drunk all the time. This is who Odin wants his son to be. That's how bad of a father Odin is. Next, let's watch how this scene ends. Get up. <sighs> You are going to Niflheim with Loki, all father's orders. You have to get up. I know you're disappointed. Disappointed? No, 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 no. That was a glorious fight. You can't even say you're sorry this time, can you? Because what's one more broken promise? Grandfather treated you like crap. You were struggling. I get it. But you can't just... We're here for you. Mom and I are here for you even when you're here. We love you. You know that. I just thought this was behind us. I fucked up. Yeah, you fucked up. 
This is why Thor is trying to be a better man and father, trying to overcome his alcoholism. Because he has a family who genuinely cares about him, and he wants to be better for them, even if he's failing now. I know I keep talking about what a piece of crap Odin is, but goddamn, it is so gross that he is actively trying to push Thor into being a worse father to his daughter, despite how clearly desperate Thor is to be that better father for her. Thor is so ashamed and humiliated in in this scene. Take it from me, the only thing worse than being a drunk asshole is realizing that you're being a drunk asshole in front of people you care about. People whose opinions you care about. People who think less of you now. Pathetic is a hard thing to be in front of your family. From here, Atreus and Thor set off to find another mask fragment. And as they do, they have a bit of a heart to heart. There's this moment where Thor says, I don't even know what you're trying to do anymore, but you have no idea what I've been through. And Atreus is like, like, actually, yeah, I kind of do. We do have things in common. We are both half-giants. We both do have overbearing fathers from whose shadows we cannot escape. We are both struggling to forge our own path. Thor says, what's the point of talking about things we can't change? And Atreus responds, who says we can't change them? And the answer is, Odin. Odin has spent Thor's entire life convincing him that he can't ever change. That he should always just be a drunk loser. Kratos and Atreus are offering Thor another choice, another path. You could change. You are smart enough to make a different choice. You don't have to be Odin's whipped dog forever. Now let's watch how this one ends. It's here. Gotcha. Phew. That was close. Um, thanks. Wasn't about to lose that. Loki, you did it. We are on the verge of great things. All of our work together. You're welcome. I'm sorry. You are here. Why? His father murdered Heimdall. For said he has proof. Take him. No. Leave him alone, I command it. You said no more Aesir blood would be spilled. You said family comes first. You don't think that this is retribution for him being here? He's put your granddaughter in danger. He's made your son miserable. Loki didn't kill Heimdall, his father did. Your daughter is old enough to make her own mistakes and your husband started drinking again all on his own. Dismissed! You two. A word. Can't you see what's happening? He's not protecting us. Magni, Modi, our boys. We used to tell them stories by the fire. Do you remember? We would carve those wooden horses. We would play and laugh until the sun sank and they fell asleep in our laps. They were thrown at the Allfather's problems like brittle knives to a mountain face. And for what? What if Thrut's next? My father against me. My daughter. I have no idea what's happening. You know, I finally thought of something I can teach you. Hey! Stand down! Sentry better be right. Where did you go? Sentry! Ugh. You sure know how to plan an exit. First, notice how Odin completely ignores Thor at the start of the scene. Atreus was only able to get the mask with Thor's help, but Odin doesn't even acknowledge Thor's presence, and instead gives Atreus all the thanks. It's like Odin doesn't care about Thor at all. It's unfortunate that Sif gets so little screen time. The little we see of her, she seems like an interesting character, but I think she needs a bit more development. Sif is identifying the right problems here, but coming to the wrong conclusions. Odin 
is the one making Thor miserable. The one who pushed him to drink again. The one putting Thrud's life in danger. She's right that Odin isn't protecting them, that he sent Magni and Modi to their deaths. That Thor needs to stand up to Odin. But Thor going after Atreus doesn't solve any of those problems. The person Thor needs to fight is Odin. But I don't think Sif has quite realized that at this point in the story. And I don't think she's realized yet what kind of person Atreus is. So she and Thor both make a mistake here. We don't see Thor again until the final battle. Thor and Kratos fight, and throughout the fight, Thor is fully giving himself over to his old self. To that old merciless and compassionless warrior. He says, no more talking, no more games, I'm gonna kill you all. Of course, like every other god who's ever confronted Kratos, he loses. But that's when things get interesting. What the fuck are you waiting for? Your daughter. My son calls her friend. If you try to hurt her... I would not. Don't you know... What I've done? Yes! But what will you do now? We don't change. I destroy us. No more. No more. For the sake of our children. We must be better. Why isn't he dead? Are you talking? Who told you to do that? You don't talk! You don't think! I think! You kill! It's a simple fucking concept! Sif was right about you. I just didn't want to see it. What is this? Are you broken? I am your father. Take the hammer and kill who I tell you to kill! I did not want this. No! Rude. This was all their fault. They've done this to us, to our family. Looks like I gotta do everything around here. Here, Kratos puts into words his entire emotional arc from the previous game. For the sake of our children, we must be better. This is the entire plot of God of War 4. This is what Kratos struggled with for that entire game. He had a monstrous and violent past, and through struggle, through growth, through parenthood, through compassion, he learned to be better for the sake of his son, learned to make a new choice. Kratos is offering this growth to Thor, offering him the same lesson he spent a lifetime learning, the same new choice he himself has discovered. If Kratos can be better, then so can Thor. And we know that Thor does want to be better. We know he wants to be a better father to Thrud. We know he tried to stop drinking. We know he is ashamed of his mistakes. And for all those reasons, he accepts Kratos' offer. He finally makes a new choice. He finally stands up to Odin. But Odin can't accept that. Notice Odin's words here. You don't talk, you don't think, I think, you kill. Odin is 
putting into words his entire relationship with his son. I think you kill. You just shut up and do what I say. You don't think about the moral or ethical consequences of what I tell you to do. You don't think about the consequences for your family of what I tell you to do. You aren't even human. You're barely more than a dog, a rabid animal for me to sick on my enemies. And then that line, are you broken? Which I must say, the voice actor delivers perfectly. Odin sounds so genuinely perplexed here. This is the way you talk about like a calculator that isn't giving you the right answers anymore. What's wrong with this thing? Is it broken? This is not the way you talk about a person and it's definitely not the way you talk about your own son. And then Thor says, no. This moment is the fulfillment of all of Thor's growth over the course of the game. In some ways, Kratos had it easier than Thor does. All Kratos had to do was make a new choice for himself. Thor has to do that and he has to stand up to his father on top of it. Because Odin cannot stand not being in control, because he would rather his son be dead than outside his control, he immediately, and without hesitation, murders his own son. I've seen some people say they are disappointed by this death, because we don't get to see Thor really live his new choice in the way we've gotten to see Kratos do. But remember that Thor is a father. His choice will live on in his daughter. In the end, he chose to be better. In the end, he chose to make his own fate. In the end, he chose to stand up to tyranny. And his daughter is going to remember those choices. Those choices will affect how she chooses to live. And I think that makes Thor's final choice here worth it. Even if he doesn't live to see it, his choice here will affect the story going forward, both for his daughter and for everyone. And his narrative presence in this story could continue to be felt, even when he is no longer actually present. Thank you.